welcome back to our human rights class. Uh, today we'll be looking at the classification of human rights. I am uh, Bernadette Atieno Chin, your lecturer for this unit. I will be taking you through classification of human rights, as I said earlier, where we'll be looking at the different categories of human rights in the world. We were able to discuss what human rights are in the last class. We were able to give an introduction to human rights. And by now we have established that human rights are rights granted to every human being by virtue of being a human being. So today we will just go into categorization of these human rights. Most of the time we find ourselves in a situation where we know what the rights are. We know that the Bill of Rights in the Constitution provides for the different types of rights we have in our country. We know the International Bill of Rights that provides for us the different types of rights, but really we never know the difference between these two or three class classes of rights. So just like we, we had introduced in the last class before we broke for the day, we will look at the two major categories of human rights that we introduced. And these are the civil and political rights vis-a-vis -vis the economic, social, and cultural rights. The International Bill of Rights, as discussed earlier, consists of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was passed into law in 1945 after the Second World War, where different countries came together and decided to sit down and come up with a Bill of Rights. I gave you an assignment to look at the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I hope you were able to look at the rights that have been provided for in that document. Also, when you look at the sources of international human rights, we find that there are laws that have gotten to the category of the customary international law where we are able to sit down as a country and decide that, uh, or rather as countries, and decide that these are the rights we want to recognize in the whole world. We also had an assignment to look at the International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights that provides for the different categories of civil and political rights. So today we'll go into de in depth to look at what these civil and political rights are. And uh, we can look at Article 26 of the ICCPR, that is the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which establishes uh, the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations. State parties to the United Nations, states that have been bound by the United Nations through their own resolution, have a duty to protect human rights. They have a duty to uphold human rights. They have a duty to defend human rights. And that is what we'll be looking at uh, in the classes as we go on with the unit. The committee established by the United Nations under the ICCPR is composed of human rights experts who are supposed to ensure that each signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights complies with the terms in that act. As a country, we are party to the ICCPR. We have ratified that particular convention and therefore we are bound by that treaty and we are bound by the protocol to that particular treaty. The committee established by the United Nations has a duty to check on whether these countries that have ratified the ICCPR or the conventions there too have not just signed the treaty, but they have gone ahead and are trying to implement the treaty in their countries. The committee therefore visits the countries every five years to ensure that they are complying with the treaties or at least are moving towards compliance with these treaties or rather with these laws. We have people we call the special rapporteurs. The special rapporteurs are people who are sent to different countries to investigate and write a report 
back to the United Nations saying, for example, if you look at the children's rights, uh, Kenya ratified the United Nations Charter on the Rights of the Child. And if you look at Kenya right now, Kenya has come up with an act of parliament called the Children's Act on, in 2001. We ratified that particular treaty and then subsequently we have been able to enact an act of parliament in compliance with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child. As a state, we have also ratified the African Charter that deals with the children's rights. We therefore have a duty to once again come up with legislation that provides for the rights of the children. But besides coming up with the laws, we have a duty to implement these laws. We, we not only must have it on paper, but we must have it even in practice. Which is why when you visit, say, the courts of law, when you'll go on your judicial attachment, you'll be able to see these things in court. You'll notice that there's a specific court that has been segregated to deal with children matters strictly. Because as states... As the world, we have come together and realized that children are a special category of people. They are a vulnerable group, separate from women, uh, the elderly, and all these people that we call a special category. We are saying that children are a special category of people in society, and therefore their rights need to be protected in a certain type of way. So in courts, we take care of them differently. If a child is, a, is an offender, we don't call them an accused person. We call them a child offender because we are saying children need to be treated in a certain type of way. If a child is taken to court as a child offender, it depends on whether they are uh, they committed the offense with adults or whether they did it as children. If they did it as children, we handle them in a different type of way. When you look at uh, children who have committed offenses, because we have children who are committing offenses, especially when they are free during the holiday season, say during the COVID period, there are a lot of children who are out there and they are idle and they don't know really what to do. So you find them committing crimes. When such a child is caught in the act and taken to court, because we are seeing that besides ratifying the laws, then you must also implement these laws. A child who is taken to court will be called a child offender, as opposed to an accused person, which is a name we use to refer to adults who are alleged to have uh, committed a particular offense. So even in the court setting, the way they are handled is different depending on the circumstances. If the child committed the offense together with a group of adults, they will be handled in a certain type of way, very special to that particular category of person. If the child committed the offense with a group of young adults, perhaps their friends, then they'll be handled differently. You remember we discussed this when we were discussing the criminal and court registry procedures where we looked at different categories of accused persons. So as a state, if the special rapporteur dealing with children's rights is sent, they are going to write in their report that Kenya has ratified uh, the ICCPR, Kenya has ratified the United Nations Charter on the Rights of the Child, it has ratified the African Charter on the Rights of the Child, it has gone ahead to pass an Act of Parliament, which is the Children's Act, we have adoption regulations in that Act, we have issues to touch on parental responsibility in that right. Really, we have everything to do with the protection of the child in that particular document. And besides that, the report will go on to say that in fact Kenya has a courtroom that is painted to uh, cater for the needs of the child, which is why when you go on judicial attachment, you'll notice that for children's courts, some of them even have cartoons. This is so as to just make the child feel comfortable in court and not make them so scared of the whole uh, situation. We are just using children as, as an example. So economic, social, and uh, cultural rights vis-a-vis -vis civil and political rights. By the end of the class, 
it is my belief that you'll be able to look at the Constitution, look at the International Bill of Rights, and categorize the different rights as per what we'll discuss. You should be able to understand better what these rights are and what makes them uh, different. In the last class you told me, some people mentioned um, a, few, a few rights. I remember we talked about the freedom of speech, we talked about the freedom of expression, we talked about fair trial, we talked about the right to life, the right to education, and all those other things that we talked about. So by the end of the lecture, we should be able to know which right falls under which category. So the first one is that uh, for the economic, social, and cultural rights, they are set out in the convention touching on uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, and that is the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Vis-a-vis -vis the civil and political rights, which are provided for in a different statute, in a different law altogether, and that is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Indeed, both were passed in 1966. After deliberations by the countries, we realized that for most of the treaties, protocols, conventions, before they are passed, different states send different delegates to sit in different conferences and come up with laws touching on different things. So that if you look at the, say, the Banjul Charter, it was a conference in Banjul, and delegates sat in a conference of sorts, deliberated on issues here and there, and they were able to come up with that particular document. The economic, social, and cultural rights are progressive as opposed to civil and political rights, which are absolute. By this, we mean that if you look at civil and political rights, for example, the right to fair trial. Everyone has a right to fair trial under Article 50 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. And if we just look at the, perhaps, Article 52, uh, Article 50, to be, which says that every accused person has the right to a fair trial, which includes the right to be informed of the charge with sufficient detail to answer it. Then here we are saying that uh, in the event that you're presented to court where it is alleged that you have committed a crime, and the court through its representatives, fails to tell you why you are being charged, why you have been brought to court, then you can immediately uh, raise an issue and file a case saying that your rights have been infringed. You automatically get this right by virtue of it being provided for in the Constitution. By virtue of you just being a human being, you have a right to fair trial, and you have a right to be given uh, reasons for any allegations that are being raised against you. You have a right to be informed of why they are accusing you of a particular thing, which is why in criminal courts, the first thing that is normally done is that you're normally read for the charge sheet, where they will tell you that you have been accused of this particular crime, and we are saying that on this particular day in this particular area, you did A, B, C, D. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? Then you decide which plea you're going to take. In the event that you're not informed of that right, in the event that you're not provided with a chance to understand what you're being accused of, then we can say that your right has been infringed to some extent. However, the court is able to explain to you why perhaps they are not going to read the charges to you on that particular day. But we are saying that by virtue of being a human being, you automatically have the right to fair trial. You automatically have uh, the right to vote, which is a civil and political right. There is nowhere you go and apply so that you, uh, you vote. By virtue of being a Kenyan and holding an identity card, automatically you are a voter. 
as opposed to economic, social, and cultural rights. And for us to understand this, I will use examples. If you look at, say, the right to housing, it is a right in the Constitution provided for by uh, our law. In the event that you don't have a house, you sleep on the streets. Or where you live, it rains and water gets into the house. You cannot go to court and sue the government because you don't have a house. Because the government will say, wait, uh, we need time to, to sort out our finances and then we can be able to give you this right. If you look at uh, how housing works, they will need to sit down with architects, they'll need to come up with uh, plans, they'll need to buy land, they'll need to construct houses they'll need to plan on how each person is going to get a house, they'll need to conduct a survey as to how many people don't have houses. Really, they'll need to do a lot of things. And so even if you take them to court, the court will tell you that, in fact, here we are acting in vain. The government needs time to, to deal with this issue, which is why uh, one of the cases that uh, we'll have towards the end of the session is one where the court says that... Uh, a particular economic, social, and cultural right is a progressive right. Just the other day, we had a decision by uh, Lady Justice Ngugi and uh, two other judges discussing the issue of the two-thirds gender rule. That decision, I believe, has gone to the Supreme Court, and we have it in, as part of our, our assignment where the courts are saying that the two-thirds gender rule has been provided for in the Constitution. Indeed, it is there. If you look at it, there are more than five articles of the Constitution asking for the issue of gender uh, parity and fairness in giving positions to gentlemen and, uh, and ladies. However, we realize that even as we stand here today, Parliament has not met that threshold. We are still not yet at that two-thirds. The economic, social, and cultural rights, they are vague and opaque, as opposed to civil and political rights that are clear or say transparent. Here, what we are saying is that for economic, social, and cultural rights, it just says, for example, you have the right to, to health. And it says that the government will come up with structures or a policy or a certain plan to cater for the rights of, uh, of health of the individuals. It is not as clear as civil and political rights, which says that you have a right to an advocate. That one is clear. You don't even need interpretation. However, if you're looking at the economic, social, and cultural rights in terms of interpretation, you have to sit down and really, really think about it as far as the provision of the right is concerned. We are also saying that uh, economic, social, and cultural rights requires government intervention. Just the example that I have, uh, I have just used for the right to housing. We need government intervention. We need financial backup, which is also another point. We need serious financial backing from the government to be able to implement such a right. We'll need to actually go to parliament and debate on this particular right, on whether we are ready to provide for it or whether we should wait and whatnot, so that that is provided for. If you look at the right to health, the government has... Of course, we can commend the government where it does something good. The government has come up with a national hospital insurance fund. Besides it being a fund, it has an act of parliament. So it means it went through the legislative making process in Kenya for it to become an act. The parliamentarians saw that uh, this is a right that needs to be provided for and uh, Indeed, we have NHIF, and NHIF is quite affordable uh, right now. There was a lot of uh, backup from government in terms of finances, and at least we are there. We are not yet uh, 
world class, but at least we are there. And NHIF has helped quite a number of you. You should be grateful to, to the government. For civil and political rights, they don't require government intervention. If we say that you have a right to be produced in court within 24 hours, what really does the government have to do with that? All they have to do is uh, educate the police officers on the rights, and that's it. You have a right produced in 24 hours unless it's a, you're arrested on a Friday or perhaps there's a holiday in between. If none of that is there, then 24 hours. The government doesn't need to put in any finances to ensure that you enjoy this right. You automatically enjoy that right. In terms of aspirations and uh, real rights, we are saying that civil and political rights are real rights. They are rights that accrue to you just by virtue of being a human being. They are rights that you can actually, they're not really tangible, but you can actually account for in the event that you're not uh, enjoying them or they are not given to you. However, economic and social, economic, social and cultural rights are aspirations. They are things we want to do. It's where we want to be in a few years, in a few months, uh, comparing with different states. If you look at South Africa, perhaps their housing is great compared to where we are. Kenya has tried, I have seen a few slum upgrade programs going on. We're not yet there, but we will get there. So there are progressive rights. There are things we want to do in the future. It's where we want to be in the uh, coming years. If you look at, say, the right to education, it's an economic, social, and cultural right. We have made great strides in uh, protection of that right. Besides providing for the right to education, we have uh, now come up with free primary education. We are now at a place where we have free secondary education. We have this issue of, uh, of uh, laptops. We have made steps towards making our education system much, much better. We have instances time without number where we are discussing how the curriculum should be changed. All these things, they are all towards uh, getting to a place where we can comfortably say that our economic, social, and cultural rights, and in particular the right to education in this case, are well provided for and protected by our country. The economic, social, and cultural rights in concluding, they have no immediate recourse in court in the event that it is not provided. And that is flowing from what I have just said. If you are not given housing by the government, you cannot go and complain and say, the government has refused to give me housing, I want them to give me housing. You will not get any recourse in court. The court will listen to you and say, eh, just give the government time, they need to, to sort this out. But we are not saying that economic and social and cultural rights have no recourse in court. In the event that you get into an accident, are taken to a hospital, they refuse to admit or administer any sort of medical attention to you, then you can sue and you will get recourse in court in terms of compensation. And our courts always give reprieve, always. At least we can say in terms of the justice system, we are doing very well. The civil and political rights have immediate recourse in court in case of breach. And breach is by the service provider. In this case, we will say perhaps the government. Or if you're working in an environment where your employer refuses to give you your civil and political rights, by all means, you can sue them. If you're not produced in court within 24 hours, you can always file a constitutional petition saying that your right to be produced within 24 hours has been infringed. In the event that you go to court and request for an advocate, perhaps if you're charged with murder, because as we learned before, there are certain crimes that you must be represented. It's not automatic for all crimes. If you request the court for an advocate and they refuse to give you an advocate, then you can sue and say that I requested the court and they refused to give me that right. You will get immediate recourse 
from the courts of law. For your assignment, you can go and look at the following uh, decisions. So we have the in the matter of the principle of gender representation in the National Assembly and the Senate. It's a 2012 decision, Electronic Kenya Law Reports. It's a decision of the Supreme Court. Please find time and read the decisions. We have the Center for Human Rights, Education and Awareness and two others versus the Speaker of the National Assembly and six others. That one is a 2017 Electronic Kenya Law Reports decision. You can just go to EKLR and you'll be able to find this decision. We have the case of Newton Joroge versus Director of Public Prosecutions 2019, uh, Electronic Kenya Law Reports, where Newton Joroge is complaining about infringement of his civil and political rights. Find time and read it. These cases are quite uh, interesting. Then Jafar Isaac Kanu versus the Ministry of Justice, National Cohesion and Constitutional Affairs, and three others. That's a 2013 decision in the Electronic Kenya uh, Law Reports. There will be more cases in the course outline. There are more cases in the Electronic Kenya Law Reports. Just read on this uh, particular rights and how people have complained and how far we have come as a country and we'll pick it up from there in the next class. Uh, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.